even after a possessed woman is delivered the bad reputation of her past will continue to haunt her even her own family members will not easily trust her when you brought me at the highest love oh yes you loved me when i was so unlovely you saw In the past few weeks, the sporting world has been shocked at some of the recent developments. Some of the great sports stars who have been shining have suddenly been quitting because of mental health issues. Simone Biles is uh, probably history's greatest gymnast and she went to Tokyo for the Olympics and everybody was waiting to see what she would do because this was an opportunity for her to carve out her history in such a way there would be no competition ever again. And at the peak of her performance and her capability, she suddenly quit and the Sporting Federation was shocked and no one knew that she was struggling with mental health issues. Naomi Osaka, world number two in tennis, pulled out of the French Open recently and that shocked the sporting world again. They realized that this is something very serious because these are sports stars who have truly made everything in life, they have reached the peak, the pinnacle of their performance and their money and they have achieved the best anyone could and yet they're struggling. And when yesterday top class English cricketer Ben Stokes said, I'm quitting because I need to focus on my mental health, then people realize this is no longer a joke. Mental health has been under threat in the past years and particularly during the pandemic, mental health problems have been the greater pandemic and a lot of young people have been affected. The world is trying to help them. Medical professionals are doing the best, but that's like giving a peppermint to cure the pandemic. What really needs to happen is that God alone can help them. It's affecting them very badly. They're trying to self-harm. There are eating disorders and some even becoming suicidal. I want to share with you in today's message how one of the worst mental health victims in the Bible experienced a dramatic change in her life. What was her medicine? What really cured her? was her deep hunger for Jesus. Realize that this is a powerful medicine for emotional struggles. And so may God speak to us through today's message entitled The Faith of Mary Magdalene. There's no greater love than this There's no greater love than this That a man give his life for a friend. There is no higher sacrifice than a man. Shall we pray? Father, we pray, O oh Lord, that you may prepare our hearts as you've prepared your word. We pray, O oh Master, that you may speak to your children. All those who are listening right now, you know their deepest struggles and their battles in their mind and how many times they feel like giving up. But, O oh Lord, we pray that you may speak to them through your word today in Jesus' name. Amen. Shall we turn to John's Gospel, chapter 20, 
John chapter 20 verse 1 The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early when it was yet dark unto the sepulchre and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulchre And the first 3 words of verse 2 Then she runneth Yes athletics in the bible too a lot of people running today. Mary's running, Peter is running, John is running. All four gospel writers talk of the resurrection of Jesus. But some claim that these accounts are contradictory. Well, actually, they are complementary because they are like pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. When we put them together, we get the complete picture of what happened. John focuses only on Mary Magdalene because there is something about her that is fascinating and that we all need to know. But from the Gospels of Mark and Luke, we understand that along with Mary Magdalene were at least five women. Among them were Joanna, Salome and another Mary. What were these women doing in the story? They were, they had prepared spices and ointments on the Saturday night. But it was a Sabbath day and so they rested and then they came on Sunday to the sepulchre. Now according to Luke, they had come very early in the morning. So there was a keenness in their coming. And the purpose of their coming was to embalm the body of Jesus, not that Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus had not done their job well, but that it was not complete. And so they had come here to complete the embalming. Now, at this point, there is one natural question. Mary and all the women are walking towards the sepulchre to embalm the body of Jesus. A natural question would be, how do we get to the body of Jesus? Because there is a huge stone that is blocking the entrance. Everyone knew of the stone. In fact, Mark tells us in chapter 16, verse 3, Mark tells us, that while these women were walking towards the sepulcher, they were asking one another a question. And they said among themselves, Who shall roll us away the stone from the door of the sepulcher? Ah, so they all knew. They all had the same question. But they had no answer. Because they were just walking in the footsteps of Mary Magdalene. She seemed to be the leader of this pack. But then she had no answer either. She had no way to move the stone. All that we know is that Mary Magdalene loved Jesus dearly. And true love never stops at any hindrance and never makes any excuse while pursuing the object of its love. Mary Magdalene was driven by a deep love for Jesus. It's a love that many of us have never known. Why did Mary Magdalene love Jesus so much? Both Mark and Luke tell us that Jesus had cast out seven demons from Mary Magdalene. Now, none of us are certain of the details of this possession, but having myself witnessed such exorcism, I can tell you that all such victims suffer from severe mental health problems. None of you has ever been possessed and so you will never know what it is for a life to be completely broken down like Mary's. But when a person who's totally possessed is set free, it's a very sweet moment. I have seen terrible cases which I do not wish to mention, but 
in the peak of their possession it is so scary on one side and very sad on the other when you see how they are gripped by this evil power and the moment they are delivered you see their faces clear and they start crying they look up to the parents and say what happened to me because they can't remember anything but during that episode they struggle a lot their their minds are broken so i can tell you one thing when mary's broken life was mended by jesus her heart was filled with a deep gratitude that many of us don't have i'm not saying that you need to be broken like mary but i'm insisting that we need to be grateful like mary and her gratitude blossomed into such a sweet love that is worth preaching about today we hardly find such devoted love in the church we have all kinds of people in church we have apostles and evangelists and pastors and preachers and teachers but do we have mary magdalenes because in these days of prosperity and material abundance people don't need jesus so much they've got so many things to keep them going but it's only when a storm hits you you'll realize that this abundance cannot save you true love doesn't wait for a storm true love will seek jesus when there is no storm true love will seek jesus just for love mary magdalene is a an amazing role model for us in this matter because if you love jesus no stone can stop you a person who doesn't love jesus wouldn't make the journey that mary made they would say well there's a big stone there you know so i'll wait here let me know text me if someone has moved that stone i'll come that's not love so many of us make excuses our excuses only tell us how empty our lives are but mary didn't care no stone could stop her and even if there were a great stone god would send a mighty angel to make a way for her now we all know this resurrection narrative how this mighty angel came down to roll that stone away and we always think that the stone was rolled away for jesus remember a grave stone cannot stop a resurrected body why then was the stone rolled away the stone was not rolled away to let jesus out but to let mary in jesus was already out so think about it according to matthew the angel came about the time mary was reaching the sepulcher and so this is not an ordinary story what an honor that this broken woman whose love for jesus would not die pursuing jesus to the grave feeling that there is no hope that this woman who was so unlike the others whose life was so messed up that god looked down from heaven and favored her and honored her and sent down an angel to move that stone for her how are we going to roll the stone away mary magdalene i don't know all that i know is that stone can't stop me i will go and i will keep knocking at that stone if that is what i have to do but she went and found that god had come down remember this was not the pious mary who gave birth to jesus nor was it the prayerful mary the sister of lazarus but this was the possessed mary the messed up mary whom nobody wanted 
And it was this Mary. Now both the pious Mary and the prayerful Mary, they loved Jesus. One as a mother and the other like a sister. But neither of them was grateful like Mary Magdalene. It is that deep gratitude towards Jesus for the work that he did in her that is seen at this moment. Even the death of Jesus could not stop her from him. You see, everyone had someone, but she had only Jesus. Others moved on with their lives, but she could not move on without him. That is why at Calvary, she was the last to leave. And at the burial, she remained there long after others left. Last to leave on Good Friday night and then first to arrive on Easter Sunday. It only shows the deep devotion of Mary. But there is something else that we need to consider in this narrative. That God not only sent the angel for her, but how perfect, how timely was this move of God. Because just imagine, had the angel come down 20 minutes late, what would have happened? Mary would have been arrested because there were Roman guards placed there. So the timing of the angel was perfect. He came down just as Mary and the women came because the Bible tells us when the Roman guards saw the angel, they froze and became like dead men. And probably after that, they fled the scene and they realized the stone was rolled away because the body of Jesus would no longer be there. They would be soon dead. So the angel came at the right time. The guards left at the right time. And so God took full charge of this event in Mary's life. Now Mary Magdalene was the first Christian to make the discovery of the resurrection. This discovery was so big, so great, that she who came walking to the sepulcher went back running. Today, millions of Christians have retraced her steps. I'm not sure about you. At which point of your life you made the resurrection discovery. But I can tell you one thing. If you have made it, it turned your walking into running. It turned your mourning into dancing. It turned your placid and dull and listless Christian life into a, a love-driven, thriving worship. This is what is missing in the church today. Church has become dull and boring because the Mary Magdalene's are not there. But if our hearts were driven with this love for Jesus, then our worship our lives, our ministries, they would all be powered by this love. I want to share with you the three messages connected with Easter and the resurrection and how Mary was connected with these three messages. And may God truly inspire us through what we're going to hear. The first message of Easter was recorded only by John. And it's not a good news, it's bad news. John was the only one next to Peter. John was the only one who heard it. This is the first message of Easter and it was Mary's message. It was bad news. You read verse 2 now, John 20 verse 2. Then she runneth and cometh to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and saith unto them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulchre and we know not where they have laid him. This is Easter's breaking news from Mary. The stone is rolled away. They have taken away the body of Jesus. I have no idea what has happened to it. So Mary's first news was not that Jesus is risen, 
but Jesus is missing. He is not here. Well, that part's true. But not because he's risen, but because someone has taken his body away. And it was this wrong message that made her run. And when Peter and John got the wrong message, they also began to run. They didn't run to witness the resurrection, but they ran to confirm that the body was stolen. And this is the state of many churches today. It is Sunday, the first day of the week, and a lot of people are running, running like Mary and Peter and John, running to church, running up and down in church. What for? Because they're doing so many things. It's the first day of the week. It is Sunday. The sepulcher is open. The stone is rolled away, but the stone is still there in many hearts. Earlier, Christ was dead. But now, Christ is missing. The sole purpose for the church to exist today is to be a proof that Christ is alive. When a new soul comes to church, he sees us, he hears us, but does he encounter the presence of God? Today the church has become a place where we can meet people and we can be busy doing things for God. I wonder if one of those Pakistani Christians I have mentioned about, the one who, who was willing to lose his children and his wife, if one of those Christians would visit and he watches the way we worship and he watches the way we pray, I wonder if he would think if our Jesus is alive. Our worship so often is dead because Christ is missing. The body is taken away. We don't know where he is. And yet we come to church. It is with a lot of sadness that I am saying this. Because I am observing these things happening everywhere. All the churches are busy. There's a lot of traveling. A lot of busyness. When I look around at all the churches, I have a feeling, I don't know what feeling you have, but I have this feeling, a strong feeling, Christ is missing. They've taken him away. I don't know where he is. I'm not trying to offend anyone, but I'm only telling you what I feel honestly. I feel the church has moved into Eli's time. Eli was a, a great priest. But Eli's time was a time of great backsliding. It was the climax of a backslidden period. Ichabod, the name that was heard during his time. Emmanuel means God is with us. But Ichabod means Emmanuel has gone. The priests are there, but the glory has departed. Revival has gone, and we have only ritual. Has anyone noticed that? There was a time when the ark was missing, but maybe the ark is still here, and the higher archi is also there. The architecture is there, and the archaeology is there. Because that's what today ministry is all about. Instead of theology, it's archaeology. Instead of saying God is present, we are always digging up the past experiences of saints. God has quietly moved out of church and no one has noticed. Is anyone missing him? Samson was powerful for God. But when the spirit departed, he did not realize the world is in deep trouble. There is a massive moral shift in culture. Dark forces are taking over. Even the people of the world are noticing. But at this time, when the world needs the church the most, the church itself is a broken place. My question to you at this time is this. 
Is Christ alive in your life or is he missing? Have you at least noticed that he is missing? Or you're too busy to realize even that? This is my honest and simple question. Is there evidence of God in your life? If not, are you bothered about it? God moved out of Israel. True. But I observe something as I read that passage. It's about the time that God moved out of Israel that he moved in with Samuel. And so I believe that even as God may move out in a massive way out of Christendom, he's not going to leave his Samuels. God has his chosen ones here and there whose hearts are crying for him. And until the time of David comes when the glory is restored, let us therefore remain as a Samuel in the church. This first message of Easter is that Jesus is missing. And it's all connected with Mary. Jesus is missing is such a depressing message. But it was an honest message from a broken heart. And that's why it has so much of value. Mary Magdalene's heart loved Jesus. And that's why she missed him. None of us is a saint. We all have flaws and foibles and faults and failures. But I'm looking for Mary Magdalene's who are missing Jesus because only those who are missing him will continue to seek him. Now, this first message leads us to the second message. Mary brought this first message to Peter and John. Now, when Mary brought this first message to them, how did they respond? We read that both Peter and John ran to the sepulchre. They both ran. So they took Mary's message seriously and they both ran. Now what happened after they reached the sepulchre? You read John chapter 20 verse 5. And he stooping down and looking in saw the linen clothes lying, yet went he not in. Okay. This is about John. John stooped down, he looked in, he saw the linen clothes, yet went he not in. I'm focusing on the word saw. In the Greek language, the word for saw is blepo. Blepo means just to look at. John just looked at the scene. Today, it would have been a tourist attraction. But most of those things are missing. But here is John. Just looking. And not going in. What did he see? John says. Nothing really. There is nothing that made John notice and go in. And that's where many of us are. We got the message of Mary Magdalene. We come to the open sepulcher and we see nothing. You are a blepo Christian. Nothing makes you pursue God. Nothing makes you go in. But then in verse 6, Peter overtakes John. They were both running. John overtook him and reached the sepulcher. But Peter overtook him and went into the sepulcher. And what happened? Verse 6. Then cometh Simon Peter following him and went into the sepulchre and seeth the linen clothes lie. In the previous verse, John saw blepo. Now Peter seeth the same thing. But a different word is being used. John blepo. But Peter theorio. It's from that word we get theory. John just looked and saw nothing. But Peter 
is looking more closely. Peter is looking at the linen clothes lying there and a theory is now being formed in Peter's mind. Luke says, when Peter came and saw everything, he departed wondering in himself at what had happened. Can anyone guess what Peter could have been wondering? Mary has just told him, the body of Jesus has been stolen. Jesus has been taken away. So Peter is thinking, if the body of Jesus was stolen, then why are his clothes lying here? That's strange. Peter couldn't understand. If they've taken away his body, why do they take the trouble of removing all his linen clothes? If they were in a rush, they would have just grabbed him and taken him away. So Peter could not connect the dots. But he was wondering. At least he was thinking. What Peter did not know was the resurrection of Jesus was like the rapture. At the rapture, what happens to our clothes? Have you ever thought that if Jesus comes, I must be wearing my best clothes? Have you thought about, has anyone thought, I must be, I heard of a woman, she refused to have a shower for a long time in case Jesus came at that time. What would happen the moment Jesus comes? What would happen to your clothes? At the rapture, we would just drop our clothes and fly. The resurrection of Jesus was his rapture. In a flash, in a moment, he was gone, but his clothes were lying there. Now Peter saw it, theorio, and a theory was now formed in his head. But then it stopped with the theory. And many people are like that. Some people, they stop with the first message of Mary, Jesus is missing. And your life is a demonstration that there is no God in your life. You call yourself a Christian. But where is Christianity in your life? In your home. There is no peace. There's constant fights. And you say you're a Christian. You must be ashamed. If Jesus is in your house. Why is your house like that? No peace at home. No peace in your heart. You are affected. Your family is affected. Your children are affected. We are becoming proofs that God is missing. But some are like Peter. Maybe you are a theorio Christian. You have certain theories. And, but I want to tell you that your theories are not going to get you anywhere. All your wonderful theories will not help you. But then John overtook Peter again. In verse 8, what do we read? Then went in also that other disciple which came first to the sepulchre, and he saw and believed. This word saw is written again for the third time. The first time John saw, blepo. The second time Peter saw, theorios. The third time now John is seeing and he believed. The word here is Entirely different. It is eidos, from which we get the English word idea. It's like saying, now John looked again and an idea was forming and he said, it's like saying, okay, now I get the idea. Now I understand what's happening and he believed. Now I'm not sure what he understood or what he believed, but probably he was getting to understand it was more than just his first message of of Mary Magdalene. From the next verse we know that up to that point they had not thought about the resurrection because they had not known about it. But now they were getting to understand it a little more. But what I am truly sad about is after all that blepoing and theorioing and idosing, what did Peter and John do in the end? 
verse 10 Then the disciples went away again unto their own home That's so depressing What a bunch of hopeless apostles they come and they are right there when history is about to be made and the most important event in human history is about to take place and they missed it because they went home even after jesus appeared to mary spoke to her and she took that message to them they still wouldn't believe sometimes those who are in high places have such low expectations such low faith they went home that's it's so frustrating but not mary not mary no 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 read verse 11 but mary stood without at the sepulcher weeping and as she wept she stooped down and looked into the sepulcher the beauty in mary magdalene is this when everyone gives up mary will not she was there at the cross one among the last to leave she was there at the burial when everyone was gone and the sun had set she was still there and she was there on the resurrection morning early in the morning there is something in this mary for everyone jesus was dead but for mary jesus was fill in the blanks jesus was dead even for her but in mary's heart her love for jesus would not die jesus is dead it's true but this is the only man who gave her something to live for and mary knows he is gone but her gratitude will not go now think about it peter and john are servants of god they are apostles and even they have no hope they have given up and they went home but mary would not she wanted jesus and that is it if not alive at least dead be like mary magdalene she would not give up when all those around her that she looked up to gave up now in her depressing hope if not alive at least the body in that hope for the dead body there is a strange humor i don't know if you would notice it maybe it's dark humor but if you notice verse 13 how she desperately gives this message of his stolen body to the two angels who knew about the resurrection already and they say unto her woman why weepest thou she saith unto them because they have taken away my lord and i know not where they have laid him can you see she's still holding on to the old message the first message jesus is missing jesus is missing she gave the message first to the apostles they didn't listen so she thought let me level up she now gives the message to the angels who say why are you weeping mary for they they already know jesus is alive he's out there jesus is alive but you are weeping like he is missing but mary was so convinced and when she saw that the angels wouldn't listen then she thought let me just take it a notch higher and what did she do she in verse 14 and 15 now she is repeating this message to jesus himself 14 and 15 and when she had thus said she turned herself back and saw jesus standing and knew not that it was jesus Jesus said unto her woman why weepest thou woman why weepest thou the angels asked the same question jesus is asking the same question and her answer is still the first message what was her answer she supposing him to be the gardener said unto him sir if thou have borne him hence tell me where thou hast laid him and i will take him away mary is looking at jesus and she can't see jesus she's seeing the gardener and the humor in this is that now she's repeating the message to jesus himself jesus you are missing i don't know how you interpret that when she looked at jesus and she sees thinks this is a gardener 
and she doesn't recognize him. Probably we look at that as blindness or unbelief or maybe naturally early in the morning she wouldn't have recognized him. Maybe there was a fog in her brain. I don't know what you might say, but for me, this was the greatest moment in history because it was at this moment that Jesus revealed himself. The glorious truth of resurrection was revealed to a broken woman who would not give up. And I find that fascinating. That Mary Magdalene was the first gospel evangelist of the New Testament is not something that we should trivialize. Mary Magdalene was a formerly possessed woman. And please don't make light of that. Because I've dealt with cases and I can tell you that even after a possessed woman is delivered, the bad reputation of her past will continue to haunt her. Even her own family members will not easily trust her. But here, God is trusting Mary Magdalene with the most important news that mankind will ever receive. Is that small for you, my friend? The resurrection of Jesus was the most important event in human history. And what does God do? He bypasses even the great apostles and he chooses Mary, a woman who had been mentally and emotionally unstable and sent her as an apostle to the apostles. That's so big for me. This is our God. You have just no idea what God can do for you. You may be broken. And you may be emotionally unstable. People may reject you. They may not look at you. They may not trust you. Your past may haunt you. But I want you to know that God's eyes are on you. And when he does things, it's going to be big. And finally, the third message of Easter. The first message of Easter is Jesus is missing. The second message of Easter is Jesus is risen. Both these messages were brought by Mary Magdalene. Now comes the third message of Easter. I already told you that the resurrection of Jesus was like the rapture. Because in a flash, Jesus was gone. So I want you to imagine the rapture. If you are being caught up at the rapture, what would you do at that time? Suppose you, know, you are being caught up and your wife is being left behind. What would you tell her as you're being caught up? Would you say, thank you for everything. Please look after the children. And the key you've been looking for, it's in that shelf. Would you give the password? What would you tell your wife as you're departing? What are your last words? Have you ever thought about it? I was talking to some unfortunate souls in Germany. There's a, a believer I know there. He doesn't belong to our church. And he, he, he's a, a software consultant, a web designer. And uh, his entire life, he said, all seven terabytes of all the information he has and he's got so many computers he, even he, he he was a big person in the industry and he said his entire office in moments was gone in the floods when those powerful waters came and burst the basement door and everything was gone nothing left nothing in a moment all gone he said he was trying to salvage it, but they had, he and his wife, they just had enough time to save their lives. Their neighbors, some of them were trying the same thing. They died. He said he could see the floods coming. He saw people running. And in moments, the water was bursting through the window. I was saying, 
you know, brother, I've always thought that uh, in case there's a flood, um, I should you know, grab my passport or my laptop, or, you know, the things that are most important. He said, when you're in the situation, your brain doesn't work. It's so quick. So just in case you're caught up at the rapture, sorry, I shouldn't say that. I should have more hope. Now, because you're going to be caught up in the rapture, I shouldn't say that others are going to be left behind. That they get no hope. But just in case, in the unlikely event that you're going to leave someone in your family behind, what would you tell them as you're leaving? Okay. The rapture takes place in a nanosecond. So it means you'll be in heaven before you even realize it is the rapture. You'll be gone. Boom. In a moment. So there is absolutely nothing you can do at the rapture. Now, John is understanding something has happened to Jesus, not the first message. He's not just stolen. He's not just missing. It's more than that. He is risen. And as John looks at the sepulcher again, this time John is observing more than what he saw before. He noticed as he looked closely, something is not right about the scene. Something doesn't connect he noticed that the napkin that was placed over the face of Jesus was not just thrown aside like the rest of his linen clothes. Instead, he takes an entire verse to tell us how neatly the napkin was folded and placed at the head of that stony coffin. You read verse 7. And the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself, what is strange about this? When Lazarus came out of his grave, same John in chapter 11 verse 44, he takes the trouble to tell us that the face of Lazarus was still wrapped with a cloth. That's how dead people come out. So if Jesus had come out of his grave like Lazarus, then he would have come out with his clothes and with this linen napkin on his face, but it doesn't look like it. Not only have the clothes dropped, now the napkin is neatly folded. This clearly shows that something radically different has happened to Jesus, not like Lazarus. He wasn't just raised like Lazarus, but he was resurrected. He was raptured. Now Paul says that the Jews by nature, they look for signs. They see signs in everything. And we know about the clothes of Jesus that even when he was dying on the cross, they, they were dicing for the clothes of the dying man. Now John was seeing that the clothes of Jesus had some significance. The clothes of a raptured person should be crumpled. But it looks like Jesus has deliberately taken the time to neatly fold his napkin, it means it has been deliberately done. There is a message. Now John got the message which we wouldn't get because we are not Jews. Because it has something to do with the Hebrew tradition of a master and his servant. Now every Jewish boy knows of this tradition. When a Hebrew master is e eating at the table, a servant would be waiting by the side for him to finish. Now when the master was eating, the table was set perfectly, everything was done according to a certain order. The servant would wait, and when the master finished eating, what he would do is, is that he would just get up from the table, wipe his fingers and his mouth, and clean his beard, and then he would crumple the napkin, and he would toss it on the table, and then he would get up and go. That was a sign. The crumpled napkin was a sign that the master has finished eating. But if the master got up from the table and he folded his napkin and placed it there neatly beside his plate, the servant would not dare touch the table because the folded napkin meant, I'm coming back. The main message of Easter is more than he is risen. The folded napkin has a message from the master 
to his servants i am coming, coming back, back. That is why when Jesus was ascending, the angels told them, this same Jesus who's ascending, he is going to come back. Now this was the last message of Jesus while they could still see him. And then he was gone. And what is fascinating is, now I imagine that Mary Magdalene would be there. Knowing her character, she would have been there. But this time, she did not get depressed. Jesus was being taken away from her. But she did not cry. Instead, the Bible says, they began to worship with great joy. And they went to Jerusalem and they waited in the upper room. Acts of the Apostles chapter 1 verse 14 tells us that Mary Magdalene was probably one among them. Acts 1 14. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. Ah, with the women. The hope of the coming of the Lord is something so real, something so powerful that it affected Mary so much she couldn't cry. Because for her, the rapture became so real. This was the Mary that waited at the cross. For Jesus, This was the Mary that waited at the sepulcher of Jesus. And this was the Mary that waited again in the morning while the apostles went home. And now this is the Mary waiting in the upper room for the Holy Spirit. We don't hear about her after this. But one thing I know, the rapture was so real for her that Mary continued to wait for Jesus. And she died with that hope. My friends, I don't know what's going on in your life at this moment. But all I can say is this. For some, Jesus is missing. For some, they're looking and seeing nothing. Others are maybe forming theories. Others are trying to believe. But Jesus is more than just risen. The napkin is folded. He is coming back. Let us live with that hope. Let us live with that longing. I want to see my Jesus. I want to see my Jesus because the napkin is folded. He is coming soon, shall we stand? My heart rejoices at the sound of your appearing. My soul rejoices at the sweetness of your voice Your grace has done the final work I'm ready to depart Yes, come, O oh Lord, and satisfy my soul Lord, when you come for us Yes, we will be just like you In body, soul, and mind your holiness preserved Your faithfulness is great, O oh Lord Your promises are true The blessed hope of our salvation's near And when we hear the drum The dead in Christ shall rise up A sorrow turned to joy Rejoice, O oh saints, He's coming back again Come, O oh Lord Come, O oh Lord Maranatha, Jesus, even now O oh Lord, my heart
praise you, Jesus. Praise you, God. Praise you, God. Praise you, God. Praise you, God. Praise you, my God. Mary Magdalene, a victim of mental health problems, a woman with a broken heart and a broken life that possessed Mary, that messed up Mary, whom no one thought much of. She is connected with the three messages of Easter. You see, what a difference it makes when you love Jesus. You can sing, my heart is filled with joy. Yes, come, O Lord, I'm longing for you. Father, thank you for speaking to our hearts today. Raise up Mary Magdalene's in the church whose hearts are throbbing with love for you, whose hearts are breaking for you, O Lord. We pray that you may help, O God. O Jesus, we are called the bridal church, O God. But how little, O God, we love you. I plead, O Lord, stir up, O God, a revival in the church. Let us not just get used to Ichabod, but raise up Samuels who can hear your voice at this time. Continue to speak to your people, O God. I give them all, all those who have heard this message into your hand. You speak to them personally, O God, as they walk around, as they work, as they travel, whatever they do, O Lord. Speak to them, O Lord, and impress this message upon their hearts that they may also turn into Mary Magdalene's, that they may wait for you. The napkin is folded. You are coming back. Help us, O Lord, to look forward to your appearing with joy in our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Now may the grace of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit abide with us all until Jesus returns in glory. Amen. God bless you.